Pine, welcome to This Is Your Life. We're here at Sydney's A&A Hotel, where tonight's guest of honour is performing right behind these doors. Now at seven, he started playing the trumpet. By nine, he'd formed his own band. And by 13, well then, it was professional gigs. Until today, he's mastered over 20 different instruments. And it's no wonder he's hailed as a musical genius. Now, he's about to finish his show for the Variety Club any second. But it's a show we've set up just for the surprise. So, let's do it. Blaine Whitaker there, and the big band. We'll be back a little later. Thank you. It's uh, it's uh, it's amazing. I I completely for once I'm lost for words. <laughs> it won't last long, by the way. I'll... It'll be a different show, not quite the show that you thought, but uh... not the show I thought. <laughs> I, was, I was about to rouse on the band for the wrong playoff. <laughs> James Lloyd Morrison. You were born on the 11th of the 11th, 1962. A little Remembrance Day baby to your folks, Jess and George. Life begins with big brother John in the country town of Burrawa. When you're five, sister Catherine arrives. Then at seven, you move to Bayview on Sydney's Northern Peninsula. James, as you know, your parents are overseas on a world trip which they had booked a year ago. They can't be here, but tonight they do remember your early days from afar. Oh, dear. Hi, James. Hi, James. Remember you said one day you'd take us to Disneyland? Well, here we are, but where are you? <laughs> Actually, we're just discussing some of the adventures you got up to as a kid, remember? Yes, do you remember when you and John made the raft and took your Vegemite sandwich and set out for New Zealand? What an exciting time. Luckily, you didn't get any further than Pitwater when the water police picked you up. The worry is, we were the ones who got into trouble for being irresponsible parents. Never mind, you've made us so proud since then. We love you. Bye. Bye. James, growing up, in the gentle surrounds of Bayview provide the ideal playground. Life with your siblings looks and is picture perfect. And you are a real larrikin, usually off cooking up some monumental scheme. It was a giant leap for mankind, but one major stuff up for us. Oh, no. It's your brother John and your sister Catherine from Thailand. You're kidding! Oh! Hi, John. How are you? Oh, my. Surprise. You just dropped in, did you? <laughs> you two guys were partners in crime a lot, weren't you? Yeah, we were. There were a few times where we did push the limits. One of those I remember very well. Oh, no. In the late 60s, when the rest of the world was going to the moon on the television, James and I decided to actually launch a trip to the moon. So. We gathered all the kids in the street with all their pocket money. and those days, you could buy sky rockets. We bought 52 of them. That's right. We nailed them to a wooden box, and then James nailed me in the wooden box. <laughs> 
and then did a countdown. I had a plastic bag over my head so I could go into space, and that was that really helped. And then after he counted True. down, James lit, the, lit wick, the wick, right? And we twisted all the wicks together. That's right. I lit the wick, and of course it was on a ramp. It didn't go anywhere. It set fire to the grass and the box. There was a huge fire, and you were going to die. Dad came out and saw this fire in a box. He said, "Where's John?" I said, "He's in the rocket." <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm inside, and the smoke's going, and the thing's shaking. And I thought, oh, "I'm on my way. It's happening. I'm on my way." <laughs> you know what the shaking was? It was Dad trying to get the box open. <laughs> Catherine, any uh, trips to the moon for you? No, luckily I missed out on all of those. <laughs> no, they just looked after me. They've been great. Yeah. Good brother? Yeah, very good. Yeah, they're both great brothers. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. We oh, appreciate that's it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. See you, guys. Now, you three Morrison kids are the third generation in a musical family. And for you, James, it all started in church. Tell us how. Well, the minister played the trombone and he'd be preaching a sermon and then he'd whip the trombone out from behind the pulpit and launch into a gospel blues. I mean, it was inspiring. When Brother John is not playing his trumpet, you start practicing on this very instrument yeah. when you're seven. Then you receive trombone lessons from that same minister at your local church. At school, your science teacher is more enthusiastic about big bands than he is Bunsen burners. Absolutely. Now, both of your first musical mentors who join us now, Reverend Neil Goff and oh, Bob Hamilton. You're kidding. Oh! My goodness. Yeah. Now, Reverend, you are partly responsible for this man's musical talent. For the early part, yes. Yes, Mike. Uh, Jess Morrison came along and she had this little boy with her with an enormous instrument case. And she said, this is James, he wants to play the trombone. And I said, well, you've got to start young, but he's so small. And oh, it's it, how's he going to get the sixth position on the trombone? Because he was only this high anyway. <laughs> and she said, well, he's very determined. I said, well, that's good. You've got to be obsessed to play brass. And uh, he was obsessed. <laughs> and he played it, and he's become one of our finest trombone players. He sure uh, has. Yeah. And, and Bob, what was he like as a student at school? Oh, not much of a student, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, sounds and, uh, like I'm in trouble again. <laughs> yeah. And I had to go around and tell all the... All the uh, teachers to go easy on him because they were not going to give him... covered for me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no school certificate for you, mate, unless you... Uh, yeah. So anyhow, uh, uh, I went and persuaded them that we had a resident genius and they accepted that and he is a genius and I'm oh. most proud of him. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, we happen to have uh, a microphone oh, right here. Yeah. Would you mind uh, giving us a few of your uh, famous sound effects on the trombone? This is one of the reasons I wanted to play the trombone because you could run around the house. You had to run around the house while you did it doing this. And, and coming, up, coming up to a corner, you know, the gear changes. Well, by the time you're 12, you're completely consumed with music. Your talent is unique, and you're able to pick up virtually any instrument and teach yourself. Then, at only 13, you begin professional gigs. In fact, the Musicians' Union even overlooks the fact that you are underage in local clubs, true? That's true, yeah. Provided I stayed on the stage, I was OK. I wasn't officially in the club, was I? And after the break, James Morrison swings his way straight to the top, but first, Messages from some of the biggest names in jazz. Hello, James Morrison. This is the Browns, Raymond and Cecilia. And we want to say this is your life. life. Uh, I want to first say that you know we love you dearly because it's about 105 degrees out here and we're standing out in front of the house with makeup on. I was going to say something funny, but I don't think it's appropriate because you are a very special person to me. You're a talented man. And I think you're one of maybe a dozen individuals in the entire world who's able to do what you do with so many instruments. God bless you. Hi, James. Congratulations on your This Is Your Life. James, you're still the greatest. 
I remember the jam session we had in Montreux, Switzerland. You were the tops that evening, and I look forward to working with you again in the near future. James, have a great night. Welcome back to Sydney's a and Ballroom and the rhythm of James Morrison's life. James, it's 1978, you're 16, and just managed to scrape through the school certificate. And on that note, you leave and begin playing every night at the Paradise Jazz Cellar in King's Cross. That same year, you enrol at the New South Wales Conservatorium of Music. It's here you're discovered by the man who becomes the biggest influence in your musical life. Mm. If it wasn't for me, mate, you'd still be asleep in the foyer of the conservatorium. <laughs> ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only Don Burrows. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> God, you know. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Love the coat. Thank what you. What the lounge suite? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Asleep in the foyer? Yeah. Oh. Well, he didn't want to miss class. He was a notorious rager and jammer. He'd jam with anything that moved. So he wouldn't miss the class. He got there early and fell asleep and missed it anyway. And I stumbled on him by accident. I had nearly tripped over and going to the toilet. So I couldn't go cook because he, he was there. But he was sort of out of it. Asleep in the lobby. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but the point was um, the talent of the lad was so obvious and uh, it was just a pleasure to be part of that beginning of his development and to be there if needed and when needed and uh, to take him in the band and we went all over the place and uh, all parts of Australia and some of the overseas joints and that and I'm very proud of him. Good on you, much mate. appreciated. I'm very oh. proud of him. Thanks, <laughs> <Cheer, mate. laughs> At 18, you graduate from the Conservatorium of Music with an associate diploma in jazz. In 1983, you form your own big band with brother John. But things are a bit slow, so you both take off to the mecca of jazz, mm. New York City. And for six months, you soak up every sound in that city's legendary jazz haunts. How did you survive if you weren't working? Well, we ran out of money pretty quick and uh, we ended up busking on the streets. You could buy a can of beans for $1.22 and a loaf of bread. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have been rooming with us. But uh, <laughs> we lived on beans and bread and, and played on the street. Every now and then we'd, we'd get a good crowd, make a bit of money, and we'd just go out and blow it right away on a nice meal, have a steak or something, and then be broke again. But that was pretty rare. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, one New Yorker who takes you under his wing and makes sure that you do eat is oh. Jimmy the Waiter. Now, yes. Jimmy still works at the pizza parlour called Arturo's and sends you this message. Oh. I can't forget the night I met you. That's all I'm dreaming of. I'm still thinking about you. I still talk about you. And I remember when I first met you, how wonderful you were as a person. That's what drew me to you. But nothing's changed much since then. We still have the best sausage pizza in the world. At least our customers think so. What do you think? <laughs> this is Mr. and Mrs. Morrison over here. What do you think? Smells great. <laughs> I bet you never thought you'd see your mum and dad at Arturo. Um, I was almost going to say to them, go down to this little joint and see if Jimmy the waiter's there. <laughs> That's great. At only 25, you become the first Australian to perform with your idol and jazz icon, the late Dizzy Gillespie. Because he played the shit out of that home, let me tell you. <laughs> I ain't James, then you drive in the celebrity race at the Adelaide Grand Prix, yeah. where you finish third. But the race changes your life forever. Tell us how. I met my wife there. I met Judy. She was in the race. How did you meet her? I, I was, we're in practice and I'm following this car and this guy wouldn't let me pass, cutting me off and everything. We pull into the pits and I'm going to go and have a piece of him and say, listen, it's practice. It's so I'm walking up to the car, the driver gets out, pulls off the helmet and shakes out the long hair like in the movies and she turns around and it's her and I went, nice driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, that following year in 1988, your Miss Australia becomes yeah. Mrs. Morrison 
who joins us now. Here's Judy. Oh, dear. Hi, darling. Hi. Beautiful. Hey, you keep that a secret. Um, so, Judy, is he romantic or not? Romantic? <laughs> I, I'm a hopeless romantic, of course. This man stood in the shower, naked of course, playing my funny Valentine. I did. Remember that? Yes, yes. And also... On the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember once when I was extremely upset and he tap danced at the end of the bed. That's right, I yeah. tapped you, she was, she was upset about something and I knew she just needed a laugh and it had all... So I got out of bed and if you've ever seen me tap dance, that was naked too. <laughs> um, it, it got her laughing. Oh, I'm not a bad tap dancer. I love him to bits even though there's a lot less of you to love these days. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah. Judy, please take a seat Thank with you. us if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> James, over the years you've been part of some pretty hot musical unions and two of those collaborators join us now. Julie Anthony and Tommy Emmanuel. Oh dear, you guys! Oh, dear. Oh, Surprise! 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 Now, Julie, you've known James what? Twenty years? Twenty years, yes. Yeah. Actually, I first saw James, my husband Ed and I were invited to a musical evening at our local church right. and we sat in the audience and there was a trio on stage. And lying around the stage was also various musical instruments and this kid in a baggy suit and these little round granny glasses came out and wandered around and played all of those musical instruments and uh, the hair on the back of my neck went Bruh! And I just knew that we were watching the beginning of something incredibly special. And you were right. That's right. I was right. <laughs> you were. And Tommy, <laughs> you guys are real soulmates, aren't you? Well, we are. I mean, ever <laughs> since we met. But uh, there's a few stories that will be left out tonight, of course. Thank you. But of course, uh, Thank you. I'd have to say, uh, of all the people I've seen in the world, this guy is the greatest musician alive. Oh. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and as I once said, when God was making James Morrison, he was showing off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Oh, Thanks, Tommy. We appreciate it's you joining us. Thanks, Thanks buddy. <laughs> My, I, 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 I. James, you are a real contradiction. You're a muser who doesn't drink or smoke, but you do manage to get your highs in other ways. Have a look at this. A one, two, a one, two, three, four. Yeah. Okay. Ready, Max. Okay. Get set. Uh, go. I'm cheating. Woo! Have you always been a daredevil? Um, I, look, I guess so. Looking, <laughs> looking at that, I think I've always been an idiot. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I never felt I was. I always felt I was kind of conservative, and I think that's what made me say, well, I'd better do this, you know, to counteract that. I think I overcompensated. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's now 1990. You're not even 30, and largely responsible for the rebirth of jazz in this country. <laughs> then in your 30th year, one of yours and Judy's crowning achievements, the arrival of your son, Samuel James MacArthur Morrison. Now that must have been something to really blow your trumpet about. Absolutely. Yeah, that was the most amazing thing that it had. Didn't matter what else happened, that, that topped it. And you are at the birth? Yes, yes I, I just. I was at a gig in London and the flight was delayed and I had to get back because I heard he was coming early. Judy had called and said, I think it's gonna happen within the next 24 hours. And. Uh, I was trying to get a seat and they said, no seats. I said, I need a seat. And they, I said, any class, any flight. And finally I said, I'll buy the airline. And she looked at me and she said, you really need to get back, don't you? I said, now you've got the idea. And they, they got me on the jump seat in the cockpit and I got back about two hours before he was born. All the way in the cockpit? Yeah. yeah. Well, then in 1995, your second son, William George Roderick, is born Look five weeks premature. You're on tour again at the time and rush home. And William is transferred to a specialist unit and was a real worry for a while there, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a bit early and uh, he was having trouble breathing and they had him in a, you know, an oxygen thing and all that. But he came good, he was a fighter. 
Well, stay tuned because after the break, our King of Swing joins forces with some other greats of jazz. <laughs> Welcome back to All That Jazz and the Life of James Morrison. Well, only two months ago, another Morrison minor <laughs> arrives. Your third son, Harrison, was born six weeks early. And he's not a well little boy tonight, is he? No, he's getting better. He's, uh, he's not due to be born for another week. But, um, but uh, you, you got a, a cold and it turned into a bit of pneumonia. But uh, he's on the mend. He fed again, I'm told, tonight, just before the show. So he's, uh, a couple of days he'll be out of hospital and back home. Well, his uh, big brothers, Sam oh. and William certainly weren't going to miss tonight and give Dad a hug, and here they are. Oh. Oh. Hello, boys. Look at all the people. Sam, is it true that you're taking after Daddy and you play the trumpet? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Would you would you play something for you us? You got your trumpet. Would that be all right? Blow a big note. That's mate. the wrong one. Oh, it's okay, mate. <laughs> you hang on to it though. You hold on to it. Looks great with the dinner suit. I got an idea what you could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, James, how fortunate are you to have always known what you wanted to be and then become the best in the world at it. Almost as fortunate as us, your audience, who applaud you as an outstanding musician and a great Aussie. And there's a few of your uh, musical mates over there waiting for you to jam. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome James Morrison and his bigger than big band, who are going to play Route 66. James? Oh, mate, I'll go over. See you, mate. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So will you ever plan to go to where? Why don't you travel my way, take the highway that is the best man? Don't get your kicks on the road 66. Chicago to L.A. Don't you know it's more than two thousand miles away? Oh, and I get your fix on Route 66. This is your life. <laughs> 